All right, folks, so the new topic for this next unit is the conservation of momentum and also the conservation of energy, but I'm going to break that up into two parts. So we're starting with the conservation of momentum, and to consider this, we need to just consider what is momentum. Momentum is a property defined as the mathematical product of the mass times the velocity of an object. And so we give it this symbol P, this lowercase p, and that needs to be lowercase uh, because uppercase p is what we're using for power usually. And um, then our m, I'm trying to distinguish here, we have two vector properties. Momentum is one and velocity is another, but mass, of course, is not a vector property. So remember, vector properties are those characterized by both having magnitude and direction. And so velocity has magnitude and direction, and so does momentum. And the direction of the momentum of an object is the same as the direction of the velocity of the object. So uh, we're concerned with conservation of momentum, and we have this little statement here, momentum of an isolated system is conserved. And uh, we're, this little math expression down here, pi equals pf, means the momentum, the initial momentum, equals the final momentum. In other words, momentum is not being created, it's not being destroyed. It might be being transferred uh, from one object to another, or from one object to several, or from several to one, to in various instances. This is the basic idea, uh, that we are not creating or destroying, we're just transferring momentum, and if you add up all the momentum before, it equals the sum of all the momentum of each, the momenta, I should use momenta, that's the plural of momentum. All the momenta of all the objects prior equals all the momentum of all the momenta of all the objects after an event. And events might be an exp explosions or collisions. That's when we usually do these kind of calculations. Of course, you could just, you don't have to worry about it being conserved if you just want to talk about an instantaneous momentum of one object. Okay, there are some links there that I'm not going to click on. They're good videos, and, and you can access this PowerPoint later online, and then go click on those links, and you'll enjoy watching the videos. Uh, <clears throat> so, continuing on here. We have another simplification. Sorry, let me go back to the prior slide. What was written there says, we'll oversimplify a bit and additionally consider the total, total momentum of any system, the instant prior, immediately prior to an event, to equal the total momentum of that system in the instant immediately after the event. So it turns out that in the real world, we don't have, you know, many of the systems we consider are not completely isolated. So if you have billiard balls striking one another on a pool table, well, that pool table is what, made of slate covered with, I don't know, is it felt? In any case, there's some friction going on there between the table and the ball. Uh, and so there's going to be, it's not an isolated system because of that friction, that interaction, when we're just considering the two billiard balls. But if you um, could figure out what was the momentum of each of the balls just prior to the collision, and then just after the collision, the momentum should be conserved. So momentum is always conserved if you can think of it as just the smallest increment of time just before an incident versus the smallest increment of time just after an incident. All right, so continuing on then, we have several applications of that formula we just saw, which was PI equals PF. Here's one uh, that, that we, we oversimplify and say it applies to just elastic collisions. And later on, we'll talk about elastic collisions. Those are those in which uh, kinetic energy is conserved. But... Um, we don't have to get into the under, deep understanding of that yet. For now, let's just say um, that we have the sum of the momenta before, and, and here's the situation when you've got two objects before and still two objects afterwards. Uh, it's going to be the momentum of object one plus the momentum of object two initially. That's what the I's are for. When you add them up together, that's the total momentum before. And that's going to equal the momentum of object one and 
plus the momentum of object to final after the incident. So the sum of the momenta before equals the sum of the momenta afterwards. And this applies for two or more objects. If you need more objects, you just put in M3I V3I or M3F V3F and you have to add each term each time. That was for this particular situation is where things don't become joined or become exploded into smaller parts, something like that. <clears throat> Here we're talking about a situation which is definitely not an elastic situation, okay? The before situation has a different kinetic energy than the after situation, but we don't have to worry about that because we're not talking about energy yet. I'm just referring to energy because we use this term elastic, okay? So these two apl equations apply for situations when object one object splits into two or when two objects fuse as one. <clears throat> so here we have a situation where we had just one object before, and then let's say it exploded and uh, into two particles. Well, the total momentum of the object before is equal to the sum of the momenta of the two particles afterwards. And you uh, could again add as many terms here for as many particles as you want. Say it exploded into a thousand parts, particles. Well, it was one, let's say, billiard ball, but somehow, you know, it had a piece of, a small piece of dynamite inside or something that exploded or something like that. Well, it could blast into thousand parts but if you added up the momentum of all those thousand parts it would equal whatever the momentum of the billiard ball was before or in this case we have two things let's say colliding with each other and then they they get stuck together and make just one thing like a bullet smacking into a block or to a car running into another car and they end up mangled in such a way that they're inseparable after the collision. Well, the momentum just prior to collision equals the momentum just after, or the initial momentum of the two, you know, of the whole system, which is the sum of the two momenta, equals the momentum of the system afterwards, which is the momentum of just one object afterwards. So those are the two situations where we apply these two equations. And again, how do we come up with them? Well, we just figured out what was the to total PI, which is momentum before, and what was the total PF, momentum after. And we, we looked at the problem to see how to write up those uh, the, the equation for those two situations. <clears throat> All right, moving on, uh, because we're covering basic principles here in this first lecture on this. Uh, we're going to look at how Newton valued momentum, and he really did value momentum because he liked how it was conserved, even the vector property of it was conserved. And he didn't, this is what we usually say is Newton's second law, F equals MA, the force acting on an object is equal to the mass times the observed acceleration of the object, right? The net force, we say. Well, he didn't write it in such a way. He wrote it like this. Well, not exactly like this. He can. You, we know that acceleration is change in velocity over change in time, right? And so uh, if you take the mass times the change in velocity over change in time, that's the same as taking the mass times the acceleration. But when we set up the equation this way, then we can rearrange it just slightly. It doesn't change the math at all to look like this, where we put the mass of the object times its change in velocity, and we divide that by the time. So what we're really saying is that force, this is the way Newton liked to think of it, force equals the mass of the object, or the change in the object's velocity, and he assumed the mass of the object was pretty much constant. And so the force acting on the object is equal to the change in momentum of the object divided by the change in time. And that that was really how he thought of it. You know, the, you can see from this formula, the bigger the force uh, acting for a given amount of time, the bigger the force, the greater the change in momentum of the object. Or the smaller the force, the smaller the change in momentum of the object. Or you could say, uh, if, if the change in momentum is the same, but our time changes, then the smaller the time over which the there's a momentum change, the greater the force that was applied to it. Or the greater the time that for that same change in momentum, the less the force applied to it. Well, this leads us to another rearrangement to turn up a another property, uh, which we call impulse in physics. And that 
property is the force applied to an object multiplied by the time period over which that force was applied. So force times delta t is equal to m delta v. That's just that's what we get from multiplying from this equation that Newton liked for force, multiplying delta t on both sides. It cancels delta t on the right and puts it on the left multiplied by f. So there we go. The impulse ap uh, applied to an object, which is the force multiplied by the time that force over which that force was applied equals the change in momentum of the object. Now, note that the impulse that was applied to an object is equal to the change in the object's momentum. These are equal to each other. The impulse equals the change in momentum. And that's going to be a useful idea in a number of our problems. So, we've got <coughs> our very basic equation for momentum, which is P equals MV. And we have the very basic idea of momentum being conserved, which is initial momentum of the whole system equals the final momentum of the whole system. Then we have these particular applications that we saw uh, that where we sum up all the momenta of the different objects in the system before, and we sum up, we add up all the momenta of the objects after collision to find before and afters and they must be equal to each other in an isolated system or if we can consider just the instant before and just the instant after. Uh, and then finally we had impulse which was derived from Newton's way of looking at force. Okay, So impulse again is force times change in time and that's equal to the mass times the change in velocity which mass times the change in velocity is one way of showing change in momentum of an object.